Seljuks, the great powerful dynasty of Kinik Oz Turkic descent that emerged during the 10th century led by Sultan Tughrul Beg. After the victory of the Battle of Manazgurt, his nephew Al Parsanan would extend this empire which was based in Central Asia to Anatolia. However, after two centuries of rulership, their power would slowly diminish. The huge Mongol Empire, which was rapidly gaining power, would send the Seljuks a nightmare, Beidou Noyan, the man who spread terror through all of Persia, Syria, Egypt, Bukhara, Iraq, and Anatolia. In this video, we will explain in detail the attacks of Beidou Noyan, the end of the Seljuks, and the struggle of the Ghazis. Beidou Noyan belonged to the Beisu tribe of the Mongols, which in turn meant he had grown up in an environment that was surrounded by warrior-like nomads. Beidou was a relative of Tseq, who was one of Genghis Khan's most prominent commanders. Furthermore, his father was the commander of a Minghan unit, which meant he had control over a regiment which consisted of 1,000 Mongol households. As the eldest son of his father, Beidou was destined to become a powerful commander. Beiju Noyan too soon became a great commander as he inherited the troops under the command of his father. Not to mention, he soon became the second in command of Charmagan, one of the highest ranking commanders who had served both Genghis Khan and Agade Khan, and would take part in major attacks on Shah Jalan ad din the last Shah of the Khwarazm Empire, near Isfahan in 1228. These attacks would play an instrumental role in the ending of the Khwarazm Empire. After Chamagan's paralysis in 1241, Beiju took over his corpse and became a Tumen, meaning he would have total command of 10,000 Mongol soldiers. This position was given to him by Agade Han, who was the successor of his father, Genghis Khan. After Agade's death, Noyan started to take commands from Batu, who was Agade's nephew, as well as the founder of the Golden Horde. Prior to 1240, Mongols had expressed little to no interest in the Sanjuk Sultanate of Rum. During the reign of Sultan Ala Din Kaykubad, hostilities between the Sanjuks and Mongols amounted to nothing more than a few raids. However, after his son, Sultan Riyadh Din came to the throne, the situation worsened. Though the Seljuks still believed there was little indication of a Mongol invasion due to a peace treaty, they would soon be surprised. As just one year later, in 1242, the Mongols, who were accompanied by Armenian and Georgian contingents, would take advantage of the Babai Revolt, which was a Turkmen revolt led by Baba Ishaq, and raid the fortress of Zarid, besiege the town of Karin, and sack it. Upon sacking the city, the Mongols and their troops looted everything and anything they would see, and would even ransack the churches, most notably the Christian Georgians and Armenians would also take part in the looting of the churches. The commander of all the forces happened to be none other than Beiju Noyan. After the news of the terrible incidents had reached the Sanjuk Sultan, Riyadh din he immediately began preparations to stop Beiju and his forces. The Sultan had assembled his imperial army along with a sizable force of mercenaries consisting of soldiers from Aleppo as well as Greeks and Franks. The Sanjuk army met the Mongol army at Kuzadakh, which was located between Kerin and Erzincan. Though the exact numbers are not certain, the Mongols were definitely few in numbers as compared to the Sanjuks. In fact, at the very view of the huge army of the Sanjuks, one of Beiju's Georgian officials was frightened. However, Beiju would encourage his troops and tell them not to fear the large army, saying that it would be in their glory to defeat such a large number of troops. And so, the year was 1243, and a terrible fate was awaiting the Sedjuks. As soon as the two armies had met, Sultan Zayath din would immediately order his vanguard, which consisted of 20,000 warriors, to operate a full-on attack on the invaders. However, the 30,000 strong Mongol army would flee and lure the Seljuks vanguard into a trap, encircling them. And so, this feigned retreat would destroy the whole of the Seljuks vanguard. To make things worse, the right wing of the Seljuk army would be defeated by Aghbaha, a Georgian prince. 
Seeing the defeat of their fellow comrades, many commanders, soldiers, and mercenaries would flee from battle. Soon enough, the Sultan himself fled to Ankara. The entire withdrawal of the army happened overnight, and so, the day after the battle, Beidu Noyan and his army would discover a deserted Seljuk army camp. At the sight of it, Beidu had thought the Seljuks abandoning of the camp to be a trap. When he found that they had truly fled from battle, he went on and conquered the rest of the Sultanate. During the course of the conquest, Beju and his army would trample and sack Kayseri, Ankara, and even the great capital of the Seljuks, Kanya, which had been the pride of the Seljuk Sultans for almost 150 years. After his entire realm was conquered, Sultan Riyadh-Din was left with no choice but to submit to Beju and the Mongols. And so, he was forced to pay tribute to the Mongols in gold, horses, cattle, sheep, and slaves. This tribute amounted to 400,000 dinars in total. On top of that, Beju would install a Daruhachi to govern Rum, meaning he had left behind a governor to collect heavy taxes annually from the folk of the Seljuks. And so, it was then that the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum was finished. Their power was not enough to fend off their enemies. Just like that, they became nothing but a vassal state to the Mongols. However, years later, after the death of Sultan Qiyasuddin, rulership came upon a young, valiant Seljuk prince by the name of Izzuddin. Izzuddin was the eldest son of Sultan Qiyasuddin. He was a man who knew no such thing as submission. And so, as soon as Beju had left Anatolia, the prince, along with fellow Turkmen, Arabs, and Kurds, attacked his Mongol troops who were based at the city of Tokat. And though Izzuddin had met little success, his brother Rukun Uddin Kilic Arslan came to his aid with a counter-attack and helped liberate the city of Tokak. While they achieved this success and defeated the troops of the Mongols, Beju was busy launching raids in Syria and Iraq. However, there he had met less success. Meanwhile, Beju would be replaced by the new Hakan Guyu, who was Agade's eldest son, with El Jigade. However, it was not for long, as El Jigade and his entire family would be purged by Batu Hun as a result to their opposition against the election of Manke Hun in 1251. And so, it was now when Beju would return to his prominence. At the same time, Rum's status as a vassal state would ultimately change with the arrival of the new Mongol commander, Ulagu Hun, in the Middle East in 1256. This arrival took power away from Beju, and so he was left with no choice but to seek pasture land for his troops and Rum. As Rum was now part of the Mongol Empire, Beju Noyan decided to go and ask Sultan Izzuddin for some pasture land for his troops. However, the Sultan rejected his request, and so Beju would prepare for war. It was 1256, and the Muslims happened to be fasting then, as it was the time of Ramadan. The two armies would meet at Aksaray. However, the odds were once again in favor of Beju, as the Seljuks would once again lose the battle. This war would weaken the Sultan's power, lessen his allies, and make Beju an even more powerful commander. After the Battle of Aksaray, Ulagu himself would summon Seljuk Sultan Izzuddin and his brother, Rukun Uddin, to his headquarters. During this meeting, the Mongol prince would divide the empire of Rum between the two brothers. Rukun Uddin was given the lands from Kayseria to Armenia. Meanwhile, Izzuddin would be given the lands from Aksaray to the sea coast and would rule from Kanya to the frontier of the Greeks. And although the splitting of the empire really diminished his power, Sultan Izzuddin still wished to continue his fight against Beidu Noyan and the Mongol overlords. Soon enough, Sultan Izzuddin began preparing his army and making an alliance with the polity of Malatya. However, Beju's move was again swift and decisive. He and his forces set out in April 1257 into Galatia and Cappadocia, wreaking destruction upon Izzuddin's domains. As an even further punishment, Beju Noyan would give Sultan Izzuddin's captured forts to his brother, Rukun Uddin. Yet, Beju would not forget about Malatya. For its part in the rebellion, 
he would force Malatya to submit and obey Rukunuddin. This would in turn effectively give control of Saljuk al Rum to Rukunuddin. Fortunately for Izzuddin, Beju would finally leave Rum and join Hulagu's forces. Seeking to ward off possible further Mongol attacks, Izzuddin would send his brother Rukunuddin to Mankehan. However, instead of assisting his brother in restoring the empire, Rukunuddin would set his eyes on the whole of Rum. Rukunuddin would choose betrayal. And so, Mankeh would support him by giving him his commander, Al Jaktu's daughter, in marriage. Furthermore, he would send Al Jaktu with Rukunuddin to take over all of Rum. Rukunuddin was now in the path of betrayal and he would seek no return. Devastated upon hearing the betrayal of his brother, Izzuddin knew he had to act quick. And so, he fled to an ally of his, Eorhan. It was then that Izzuddin would set out to confront his treacherous brother, whom had only added on to the endless troubles of the Seljuks. And so, it was not long before Rukunuddin and the Mongols were defeated, and the rulership of Rum was back in the Sultan's hands. Not to mention, Rukunuddin too was captured and imprisoned. So the Izzuddin's rule would be restored, and the division would come to an end. Though Sultan Izzuddin had lived his entire life fighting for his nation, his efforts could not be enough. After all, the Sanjuk Sultanate was in no shape to be fighting with the mighty Mongol Empire of Mankehan. Like all other mighty empires, the Sanjuks were destined to be ended. With the constant raids and attacks led by Beijunoyan and other Mongol commanders, Izzuddin's kingdom was upon its termination. The Mongol ruler, Manke, would send the amount of troops that weakened small kingdom could not possibly stand. Izzuddin's battles in Rum would surely come to an end. However, unlike his brother, his legacy would not. In 1262, Izzuddin was left with no choice but to flee from Kanya to Crimea, where he would ally with his Muslim friend, Burke Hun. It was then that he would marry to Burke's daughter, Urbe Hatun. Burke had made Sultan Izzuddin the ruler of all of Crimea, and so Izzuddin showed the world that no matter where he went, he was truly meant to be a king. Sultan Izzuddin Kekawus II would pass away in 1279 in Crimea. Though deposed and exiled, he had remained very popular and influential among the Turkmen of Anatolia. He had surely won the hearts of his people, whom he had fought for. Meanwhile, Rukunuddin, who worked for the Mongols, had earned himself a rather dishonorable reputation, and in 1266 he was soon executed by his own personal aide, Provani. Two brothers, one was loved and respected by his people, lived honorably, fought for his people, and died as a hero. The other, a puppet of the Mongols, whom had only intention to gain power, whether his people suffered or enjoyed it. Today, historians and professors live to tell their tales, and no matter how powerful they were, how much wealth they had, it no longer matters. The only thing that could possibly be of any use to them now is their legacy, which has become history. As for the powerful Mongol commander, Beijunoyan, his power was decreasing as time was going by. The reason being, ever since 1256, when the Mongol prince Hulagu arrived near Anatolia, Beiju's influence had already somewhat lessened. The coming of Hulagu made it known that Beiju was no longer the supreme commander, and so he was in fact being replaced by Mankei Han. The reason for this was the fact that Beiju had failed to send Mongol power further, leaving the Beyliks of Anatolia and Georgia free from Mongol rule. From then on, Beiju would serve and take command from Hulagu. It was Hulagu who sent him to dethrone Izzuddin in 1256, help with the sacking of Baghdad in 1258, and advance towards Syria and Egypt in 1259. However, after the death of Manke Hun, Hulagu would leave his army and hurry towards Kerukuram. The next in command was Qutbuka, a Christian Latun of Hulagu. And so, Beiju would yet again work under the command of his superior. However, it was not for long that Beiju Noyan would continue his role as a Mongol official, as he would soon be executed by Hulagu as a result for his failure in stopping the force of the Golden Horde from fleeing to Russia during the battles between Qutbukha and Kublai. And so, it was the end of the famous Beiju Noyan, the one who had single-handedly ended the whole of the Seljuk dynasty in but one battle. 
Beiju had become the nightmare of the Middle East, yet he couldn't prevent his own death. He died without honor or a purpose. He sought glory through position, status, bloodshed, wealth, and victory, yet he died with none of those. All his life, his efforts were wasted. How could he have known that himself, the bloodthirsty, fearless Mongol commander, Beiju Noyan, would have his end no different than that of his victims? Could it ever have possibly crossed his mind? Meanwhile, Sultan Izzuddin Kaykarus ibn Kaykhusro was still standing proudly up in the mountains of Crimea waiting for a resurrection with his pride and dignity intact. He waited so that a day would come and a valiant Turk would again liberate the lands, unite the tribes, and rule over three continents for over 600 years with justice, equality, and morality. A mighty, honorable empire would surely come, and Izzuddin knew it. It was only a matter of time for history to witness the rest.